you very much. And we now, oh, jinx, she didn't have. See, I feel as if I'm at a pop concert with it coming out of that volume. Uh, can I welcome everyone? Pardon? <laughs> You're not getting any questions for that. Uh, can I welcome everyone to the second meeting of the Justice Committee in 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices? I think it's still loud. <laughs> Even when switched to silent, the interview with broadcasting. Um, I've got apologies from John Finney. I'm now whispering, hoping it will go down. <laughs> I go to item one. Uh, I welcome Jane Baxter as our new member of the committee. What a turnover we have. We must be some kind of gulag for people, I think. Our first item of business today is to invite... Uh, Jane Baxter to clear any interests that are relevant to the remit of this committee, Jane. Thank you. Could you put a microphone to oh, say it again, please? I have nothing to declare. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Item two, we're invited to agree to consider item four, consideration of our approach to stage one, scrutiny of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill in private. Are you agreed? Thank you very much. Item three, Prisoners Control of Re Scotland Bill. This is our first day of evidence taking at stage one of the Prisoners Control of Re Scotland Bill. And I welcome to our meeting from the University of Strathclyde, Dr. Monica Barry, Principal Research Fellow, University of Clyde, alone and palely loitering. Dr. Barry, but unfortunately this is due to the family, a family illness. Professor Cyrus Tassa, a professor of law and criminal justice from the same university, has had to withdraw at short notice. I hope he'll be able to give evidence at a future meeting. So if he was able to come next week, would you be content? Thank you very much. We've written submissions, so I'll go straight to questions. Questions, please. Gil, followed by Elaine. Thanks very much. I'm particularly interested in... Uh, addressing uh, um, sexual offenders' their behaviour. Uh, personal interest in that. And I wondered uh, if uh, the fact that early uh, release uh, takes place and knowing that people to address their, their offending, for instance in Peterhead I know there was a particularly good scheme uh, that w was happening uh, but it relied, of course, on people volunteering, uh, and I suspect that some of them volunteered to play up to the, uh, the par uh, parole uh, board. Uh, and, but the, the, the indicator suggested that it was very, very successful. So that if uh, error le release uh, uh, stops, would that, in effect, what's your feelings about what impact that would make? Is it a good thing that perhaps there's more time for people to ref reflect and understand that they're going to be here longer if they don't participate and get working on it uh, for the two reasons that I mentioned, uh, for the good reason and the reason just to get out of the place uh, or is, is there a downside to this I, I know and that, that there may be some downsides and I wondered what your feelings were in, in regard to that I mean I would say firstly that sex offenders are the most compliant of ex-prisoners that you will find I think they're absolutely paranoid about being returned to prison following recall um, and they do tend to keep to the conditions of their license but in terms of sex offender programs a lot of people I've spoken to I've done research with um, high risk sexual and violent offenders both in London who are on levels 2 and 3 MAPA and also with about 70 people on licence in Scotland and they all say, the sex offenders say that the programmes do help but um, they don't have the time for them and there's an assumption in the bill that if automatic early release is abolished prisoners will more readily take up these group work programs but the point is that um, there are waiting lists for these programs both in Peterhead and elsewhere so not everyone can access them at the time that they're in prison and I've been told both by prisoners and by sheriffs that extended sentences are often used as a way to ensure that people get programs in the community which I think is the wrong use of extended sentences, certainly. So there's not a, a demand problem with programmes, there's a supply problem. There aren't enough programmes in the prison, so people are being 
put out into the community and asked to do the programmes there. And uh, the other thing while I'm on that is the open estate. Um, to get parole, people have to have time in the open estate and there are waiting lists for that as well for some reason. So um, there's, no, there's no possibility sometimes for people to get parole and therefore they're dependent on the automatic early release at the two-thirds stage. So there's a, maybe a, perhaps a, a resource a question? In, in, there's in definitely that. a resource question yeah. now, and that will be exacerbated if these reforms go yeah. through. I'm interested in the, the fact that you said that um, programmes uh, after people are released, and since it would mean that people again would need to volunteer, they couldn't be coerced into it. So is it... Uh, more reliable, if you like. Let's. I take on board that you said there's a resource element to it. It would be the, you know, the, the idea that folk would volunteer uh, uh, after being released uh, in great numbers. I find difficult to comprehend. Uh, but if there was not a release, if the what the the resource element you talk about, if that wasn't a barrier, would you think that? if the resource was there, that we would enjoy higher numbers of people presenting voluntarily within prison? I'm not sure, but I'm, I think prisoners who are released on non-parole licence have to undertake the programme in the community if they haven't done it in prison. And I apologise if I'm wrong on that but I'm pretty sure that's part of the conditions of the non-parole license if they haven't done a course in prison that needs to be done they have to do it in the community which is why sheriffs are putting extended sentences in place to ensure that there's time for them to do that some sex offenders would do programs voluntarily but I doubt many violent offenders would for example and there's probably a quite a sizable minority of sex offenders who wouldn't <coughs> voluntarily. I certainly know that long time ago when I visited Peter Hayden, it may be out different now that one of the issues put to us is that many of them were in denial, in fact, who didn't think they'd committed mm. an offence, particularly if it was, you know, children were involved in it. And that was a huge difficulty. It's getting them to see that they had, in fact, were guilty of an offence in the first place. Mm. Is that correct? Is that yes, it is. But I mean, that's that's a minority, I think. Okay. And and they do tend to do the programmes, not least because if they don't do the programmes, they don't get out. I understand that's um, compliance, but whether or not it means anything to the programme yes, is another thing. I mean, some people I've talked to have said they went into the programme thinking I'll just do this for tokenistic purposes, um, but they come out thinking it really did help them. Okay. Made them change their mindset. Thank you. Um, I've got. Um, Eileen, followed by Roderick. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 convener. Um, Dr Barney, in your uh, submission to the committee, you're actually pretty critical of this legislation. You describe it as a flawed change in legislation and in undermining rather than strengthening the role of both deterrence and reintegration. Um, I wondered if you felt the alternative proposals in the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Scotland Act in 2007, which haven't been enacted, in which there was a custody element and a community element to sentence, whether that would be preferable to the approach being taken in this bill? It would be much preferable, yes. Um, the, I don't know why the, the reforms from the 2007 Act haven't been enacted, but um, it's vital that you have a community part to any custodial sentence because that enables people to be tested in the community. People aren't going to re-offend in prison uh, in a way that's going to uh, harm the public, obviously. So it's only when they're released um, that the potential for risk is there. So they need to have that kind of monitoring and supervision in place when they get out of prison. And, you know, the longer somebody's in prison, the more 
need there is to adapt to life on the outside and the more support they need for that. And many of these people, especially sex offenders, don't have social networks in the community that they can call on. So they're dependent on social workers and the police. Um, many people have said to me they, they look forward to having a police visit once a week if they're on a sex offender notification requirement, for example. Um, because it's company, it's somebody to talk to. So they really are desperate for that kind of uh, social support. Uh, and the, your principal concern about the bill as it is drafted is that, in fact, um, that they'd lessen the support which is available compared to what... There will be no the support for mm. the most potentially high-risk people uh, if the reforms go through. Because once they're out after a full term of imprisonment. There's no statutory requirement to look after them. So you would not agree that the proposed reforms would uh, help to protect the public in that case? Not at all, no. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Roderick, please. Thank you, convener. I have a couple of um, uh, disparate questions. For, first of all, uh, the policy memorandum, um, Dr Barry, the government's policy memorandum, makes it clear the reforms will not mean that all prisoners affected by the ending of automatic early release will necessarily serve their entire sentence in custody. Prisoners will, will be able to be considered on a regular basis for parole. If the parole board is satisfied that a prisoner poses an acceptable risk to the public safety at a given point in the sentence, discretionary early release on parole license will take place. So there will still be an incentive to a prisoner. Um, would you agree with that? Um, <clears throat> yes, but uh, given that I think it's only something like 25 or 30 percent of people who go forward for parole actually get it, um, there's not much incentive there, and prisoners know that it's unlikely, depending on their offence, um, that they will get parole. And also, if they've not done the programmes because there's a waiting list, and they've not been in the open estate because there's a waiting list, then they're unlikely to get parole. But yes, they can continue seeking it every year or two, whenever it is. But, I mean, the point I would like to make is that if somebody is deemed eligible for parole and gets out, that is no guarantee that they're not going to reoffend. You can never guarantee that somebody is not going to reoffend. And if they don't get out because they're deemed a risk to the public in January 2015, but they do get out in January 2016, having served the full term of the imprisonment, then that risk isn't going to change. And if they're without support in January 2016, at all, then the risk of them reoffending is exacerbated. Um, the, the, the policy memorandum makes it clear that uh, uh, there are uh, alternatives, extended sentence, and the use of MAPA, um, which could come into play if these proposals are legislated. Are there any comments on that in terms of? Uh, Support. Um, yeah, extended sentences and SOPOs, sexual offences prevention orders, um, and MAPA itself will not make up for the lack of supervision and support that can be given through criminal justice social work. Um, these additional sentences, and they are additional sentences in the eyes of prisoners, so they're a double punishment in a way. They're purely for monitoring behaviour and uh, managing risk and um, prisoners think that they're a kind of catch-all to you know trip people up and get them recalled to prison as soon as possible that's what they think they're for they don't see them as a help at all can, can you help us on, on a different matter on kind of figure work at the present time that those uh, prisoners at the present time who are released at the two-thirds point and then obviously subject to supervision. What's their reoffending rate in that uh, period in which they're subject to supervision as opposed to ongoing after the supervision has ended? Is there a distinction in, in the reoffending rate? Um, we've just completed a study, the fieldwork of a study, um, which is looking at 10,000 
people on community-based supervision, either community payback orders or post-release license conditions. But unfortunately, we haven't analysed that yet, but I can certainly get that to you when we do. But I suspect from previous research that people on non-parole licence um, are more likely to re-offend than people on parole licence. And people on no licence conditions whatsoever are more likely to offend than people on on licence. It would be useful to look at the kind of the same uh, individuals, as it were, kind of um, subject to supervision reoffending rate and non-subject to supervision reoffending rate. So, yeah, I, any, I think any information would be helpful. However, I think the convener mm -hmm. would agree. I certainly yeah, always yeah, agree yeah. with you, Roderick. But I mean, that would that would take time because. Um, the people who are not subject to supervision now are a different type of person with mm. a different type of offence mm. and have been in prison for a much shorter period of time. So to really look at that, you need four or five years to be able to a, get them when the new re legislation is out, if it comes out, and then spend over two years looking at their reconviction dates once they're in the community again. So it would take time. When, when you say time, uh, uh, Doctor, it, it, we, I haven't, I've just been discussing with the clerks about this. We've got to the end of February before we have to draft a report. Would that information be available by then? Our information will be, yes. That's excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Christian, followed by Margaret. There you go, and good morning. Uh, I just uh, wanted to have some clarification when you talk about uh, uh, serious offenders and talking about uh, uh, the bill. Uh, the bill talks about only uh, um, a very limited amount of offenders. Do you think that there will be more merit to the bill if it was for all offenders? No. Um, because I don't think there are any merits in the bill in terms of reducing reoffending or encouraging reintegration. Um, what I would say is that they're, if they're piloting this with high-risk violent offenders and sex offenders, then they're probably piloting the wrong people. Uh, they should be going for the lower end if they're going to abolish early release. So, for example, dangerous driving, which is probably a higher risk to the public than sex offenders, um, or common street crimes such as shoplifting, theft, breach of the peace. If, if people are in custody for under four years, under two years possibly, there's a likelihood that they will survive better after a full term of imprisonment and no support in the community. But the longer you're in prison uh, and the more stigma attached to the offence, such as sexual offending, then the more support you need when you get out. Going back to uh, what uh, my colleague Roderick Cobble asked for about MAPA, uh, you don't see any... Um, any justification of having anything after the sentence, after the end of the sentencing? I'm not sure, I would have to check this, but I'm not convinced that MAPA has a statutory obligation if the person is not on licence. I may be wrong there. Um, and I'm happy for somebody to tell me otherwise, but if there is no statutory obligation for social work to help that person or to monitor their risk, um, then it would be very difficult to hold them to account. Whereas if they're on licence, it's a, a statutory obligation. So you would be quite happy for that type of services to be just at the end of the sentence, but not after? No, that can be after, as long as there is support in place. There's no point in monitoring somebody in a vacuum. You have to give them proactive support in terms of accommodation, employment, education, benefits, etc. Thank you. 
Yep. Thank you. Um, Margaret, please. Yep. Good morning, Dr. Bright. I wonder if you could comment, um, obviously the, the bill targets and pilots sex offenders um, with custodial sentence of four years or more, other offenders with custodial sentence of ten years or more. Given what you've said about recidivism and that category of, of offenders who are more likely to re-offend, is there a case um, really for more wide-ranging reform of the system of early release? And, and you've gone a little bit into where you would start with this, but if you could expand on that, it would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think um, there needs to be much more wide-ranging reform to the criminal justice system generally. Um, and firstly, I mean, as I mentioned, the group work programs in prison need to be expanded, and that's whatever happens reform-wise. There needs to be more access to programs for people when they need them and even if they're transferred to a different prison they need to be able to continue the program that they started and that's an issue for some prisoners. There also needs to be um, greater use of the open estate if people need the open estate before they can get parole. Um, uh, in terms of the, the 2007 legislation needs to be enforced, I think, with half custody, half community. Um, and breach, our study just now is uh, looking at 250 offenders who have breached or not breached community payback or post-release license conditions. And as I said, those findings will be later this year. But They've said that breach conditions are overly strenuous to adhere to. So breach needs to be loosened, I think, uh, whether or not uh, somebody is given parole or non-parole. And community supervision needs to be much more proactive, which means social workers not only having more resources to look after people on release, but also more of a, a remit and encouragement to help them gain constructive activity in the community. Without any constructive activity, they're not going to feel part of that community. They're not going to uh, reintegrate easily. Um, and also, there needs to be much greater prison-based planning for release. I mean, I know the reforms are suggesting if somebody gets out on a Thursday or on a Friday, it might help, but I have my doubts about that. I think they need planning in prison for about three months prior to release, and they're not getting it just now. If they get parole, um, they're let out the next day, and there's, very, there's no planning that you can do in that time. So the whole system needs to change. Housing needs to be more proactive and hold beds for people who are potentially going to get out on parole or non-parole. Given the cost of reoffending is about three billion a year, um, it seems to me to make sense that you put many more resources into the kind of activities you've just explained rather than um, maybe some of the approaches we are taking. Just finally, I, I wonder if um, you could comment on the perception issue and f is in your, in your opinion, does the act as drafted or the bill as drafted clarify sentencing policy? Is there a need to clarify? Is there some confusion here? Uh, I don't think it does clarify it. I think it uh, muddies the water even more and it's at the expense of one of the most vulnerable groups. Uh, so it's playing into the hands of uh, a baying public in a way and the media. And it seems to have more electoral appeal than enhancing public protection. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, the, the 2007 Act clarifies things a lot more, I think. You know, it is, 
it is obvious that it is half community, half half prison, half community. And that in the community it's rehabilitation, not purely surveillance. Right, thank you for that. Can I just pick you up on what I, I'm interested in your line? You said 250 offenders breached or not breached community payback orders. You're looking at them just now. You, you, you said breach has to be loosened. Could you the breach criteria have to be loosened. The criteria yeah. has to be loosened. Could you just expand um, on that a little bit, please? Social workers currently, um, a lot of social workers are going by the book and saying if you don't... Um, if you don't turn up for two appointments, then you're breached. And if you don't have a valid reason for not turning up, then you're breached. Um, and if your grandmother dies and you can't attend an appointment, you need a death certificate. You know, I mean, things are getting quite out of hand, I think. And for sex offenders, they're being um, alleged to have committed a further offence when they insist they haven't and they're recalled to prison on the basis of an allegation by a member of the public um, and they can be there for years before they're let out again even if they're found not guilty of the, pre of the subsequent offence. Seems quite extraordinary that It finals. happens. I mean, the In parole Scotland board that should, happens. Yes, it happens quite a bit. And the parole board takes a long time to, I mean, it's not their fault, but it takes a long time to um, go through the paperwork to get somebody back out of prison once they've been recalled. It can take three months. Um, but you've just said somebody could be in for years. Yeah. Uh, when I would have thought that the Crown Office has to bring a prosecution forward if there's been an allegation of another offence, they must surely be prosecuted for a subsequent offence. Well yes, out. but that can take time. But also, I mean, it depends on why they're recalled. But if they're recalled on the basis of an allegation um, or because of breaching um, technical conditions of their licence, then they can be kept in prison for the duration of the... Uh, sentence, the original sentence, which can be years. So yes, I, I accept that if it's an allegation which is prosecutable, then it will take less time, but it's still, I mean, people have told me they've, that it's taken three to six months to, or longer to get the case taken to court, and then it can, once found not guilty, it can take three months to get them out. I think for clarification, um, I've now got Jane. Your you know. maiden voyage. <laughs> morning. Um, you've spoken this morning about um, the impact of social isolation and the lack of community networks on people, on prisoners who've been released and living in the community. And um, you've also spoken about the need for more proactive approaches and, and additional resources. So if, if those things are not addressed um, and this legislation goes through, how do you think that's going to impact on the current workload of criminal justice social workers who you've said play such an important role? Is their capacity to be effective going to be even more squeezed than it is at the moment? Well, it, it depends. I mean, if, if people are released with no uh, statutory supervision, then it won't impact on criminal justice social workers at all. Um, but it will impact on uh, humanity, certainly, and on the community, because people will be without accommodation, possibly without employment, without social networks, and without any statutory author authority to, um, to help them get back on their feet. So, I mean, offending is likely to increase yeah. if there's no support. And that's a research finding, that the less support people have, the more likely they are to resort to offending. I've had prisoners tell me that when they were released and they had no support from social work, they actually phoned the police and said, can I come back inside? Mm. Okay. And that's a damning indictment. Of Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Thank you. I have no further questions, so I thank you very much for your evidence, and I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to allow the witnesses to change. Thank you very much.
That's vol- very much. Uh, now welcome to the meeting our second panel of witnesses, Lisa McKenzie, Policy and Public Affairs Manager, Howard League Scotland, Pete White, National Coordinator, Positive Prison, Positive Futures, Professor Alan Miller, Chair, Scottish Human Rights Commission, and Sarah Crombie, Acting Director of Corporate Services, Victim Support Scotland. Don't take this the wrong way, but usual suspects. Here we go. Uh, um, and now we have your written submissions, so if we go straight to questions, Elaine. Uh, thanks very much. much. Um, I don't know how much of the previous uh, witness that you, some of you have seen, I, I think, and you'll, if you have, you'll be aware that she described the legislation as being flawed. Now, m many of you have also indicated concerns about the legislation, in particular the uh, release of people at the end of a sentence into the community without any support. Um, I wondered, first of all, as you will know, that the... Um, What's the name of the bill? The 2007 Act. I'll get, I'll get the criminal custodial sen no, no, yeah, custodial sentences and weapons Scotland Act 2007 proposed a different approach where there was a sentence would have a imprisonment part and a community section. Um, I just wondered whether you could comment on the relevant relative merits or demerits of those alternative approaches to this issue. I should. You just indicate to me if you want to. Be called and I'll, I'll call you. So, who would like to pick up that one? <laughs> Nobody. Right? <laughs> That's the end of the session. Uh, uh, Miss Crombie. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, with uh, Victim Support Scotland, then, we, we do actually quite like the, the 2007 um, Act, as in the, the victim knowing more clearly and being more transparent as to the amount of time that an offender spends in custody and the amount of time that they will actually have um, uh, be spending in the, the community. Um, with uh, victims then it's, it's, very, it's crucial and it's very important that they're aware of um, any conditions that offenders may have attached and they are given that information proactively um, so that if they do have any safety concerns, then they have time to put those safety concerns into place. So um, we believe as an organisation that uh, for victims to, to know what to expect, so they know how much time is being spent in custody and how much time will be spent rehabilitating and reintegrating into the community is a positive. Mr White, do you wish to grab? Thank you. Um, first of all, I agree with uh, Sarah and her uh, focus on the need for victims to know when someone is going to be released. However, I think the 2007 bill was drafted at a time before the prison service uh, went through some kind of a transformation in its view of how it can work um, to help people in prison leave in a better state. And I think that the, um, there is scope for a review of that bill and this one together to take into account a wider range of options than are currently um, available. I think we need to help um, the justiciary to recognise that prison is the last resort and not a handy one and to find them a, a way of being more comfortable with handing down community sentences in the first place um, because that's better for everybody um, at the end of the day. So <clears throat> I think that there are some parts of the bill we're discussing today that are um, highly commendable, but I think it too is flawed and we need to look at the whole system from the point of someone being charged right through to their return to the community as a citizen um, rather than just bits and pieces of it all. Anybody else wants to comment? On the flaws. There aren't flaws then, yeah. Miss McKenzie or... Sorry, in the current proposal and, and, and yeah, the 2007 well I have to be honest in that the, the 2007 leg legislation predates my role um, mm. so it's not a piece of legislation I'm very familiar with and I know that the Herald League Scotland presumably at the time as well um, did oppose bringing it into force and I know then the, the Cliche Commission mm. identified a number of concerns um, so I'm I oh, don't feel I'm terribly well qualified to say no, much more than that. No, point. but I mean, I've certainly in terms of the current proposals, um, I mean, from my point of view, this is being advanced on a platform, well, it's, it's stated in the policy memorandum, it's been advanced on a platform of 
uh, increasing the likelihood of reducing reoffending and improving public safety. Um, so we ought to measure measure the current proposals against the evidence base suggests that that might be the case and I think the concern is that presumably part of the reason why the proposal has been advanced is that there is a desire to retain some people in custody to the end of the sentence um, but I mean as, as Dr Barry has already said uh, I think we have some real concerns about the idea of these people being sort of spat out of prison cold with no supervision or support and, and it, with that in mind it's hard to see how that would increase public safety um, and reduce reoffending if there's clearly a desire to retain some people in prison to the end of the sentence. Otherwise, I assume these proposals wouldn't be being advanced as they are. What I'm saying is let's measure the proposals against the policy objectives. And I think we have some concerns that they won't actually live up to that. And I think, and I know victim support has made this point, there's a lot of public misunderstanding about the criminal justice processes. And what we, what we really don't want to do is run the hazard of increasing public cynicism about the criminal justice system. Um, this, you know, think the automatic early release is not terribly well understood as it stands uh, and if the government stands on a platform and says we have these new proposals they're going to increase public safety and they don't then that there's a real hazard that you can in increase levels of cynicism um, and I think that's something to keep in mind I think that's quite important would it be fair to say that um, we've had evidence if you've heard it from I'm not saying it's right or wrong from the SPS and the CAMSEC and ministers that you know the view the prisons will now take on much more serious the preparing packages for individual prisoners you don't just you know one day you're in prison the next minute you're out and it's not just simply releasing them other than on a Friday but on a, a day of the week that's more convenient for them to be dealing with the services such as social work and housing but that there will be other support when they come out so it's a fluidity of being released from prison to have GP services and so on is it fair to say that this should be seen in the light of that that as you say, prison's changing in a way. Or yeah, it although it's, that be. does differ from statutory supervision. If you're not compelled to comply uh, with statutory supervision license or, um, conditions. I mean, it's absolutely right that you should ensure that when someone comes out of prison, best efforts are made to ensure they have adequate housing, that they access GP services, addiction services, and so on. Um, but that's, uh, and obviously it's absolutely right, there should be programmes in prison to prepare people, but we've already heard from Dr Barry that she has some real concerns that those programmes are not always available. Yes. Um, and I think, and the other point that we made in our original submission was that if those programmes aren't available and prisoners are saying, well, I want to put myself forward for parole, but I can't access the programmes, then you, th you might be laying... Um, laying open to sort of further legal cases where they say, well, I'm being arbitrarily detained. I would like to prove to everyone that I am no longer a risk, but I'm unable to because I can't access programmes. And I think that's also a real concern. Mr White, you wanted to... I think it's fair to say that the SBS have changed their attitude and changed their planning, but they haven't actually been able to change the way in which the prisons are run on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. The access um, that prisoners have to education and to courses is uh, minimal compared to what's required. The, um, and I think there's a huge resource reallocation required to make it viable. If someone's going to spend any time in prison, it's important that services are provided that they can connect with that will help them on their path back to being a contributing citizen. And I think that um, at the moment that's a vastly under-resourced, um, unrecognised problem. And so in, in Edinburgh, for example, where there's over 800 prisoners, only 43 can attend education at any one time. And that is a, a huge disparity compared to what's required. I know education isn't the only part that's required, no, but no. it is a problem. And that re that's represented in other ways. Thank you. Professor Miller, do you want to make comment? And um, well, just picking up on, on the last uh, few um, comments, I think um, good intentions, as we found out, don't always lead to good practice. And yeah. Good intentions are good, but they're, they're not enough. Uh, and I think you have heard from witnesses that uh, the current resources within prison and out with prison uh, are not seen as being adequate. This on any measure is going to increase the spotlight on these resources and whether they're adequate or not. And despite the good intentions, we know we're in times of austerity and that's not going to go away in the, <coughs> the immediate future so that there is a real danger that with the best intentions there will be unintended consequences, which are foreseeable today. Uh, that this will actually increase the risk to public protection uh, and not re reduce reoffending uh, and therefore not achieve the, the good intentions that, that we all recognise. So on, on reading the submissions that have come in so far, I became increasingly concerned 
uh, that to a certain extent this legislation is tokenistic. It will only affect something like 1% of the prison population. And should we not actually be taking a, a deeper look at the whole process of sentencing policy and what prison means and what, what, what post-prison means, that maybe this is reacting to pressures from within the media rather than actually looking at the problem. What, politicians <laughs> reacting to the media? Oh, for goodness sake, breaking news. Yes. Do you want to comment on the comments? <laughs> observation. It would be, I mean, the Sentencing Council, as I understand it, are recruiting staff now, so it seems a shame, in a way, to be pre-empting their existence when I presume this is the sort of thing that they might be able to uh, take a look at in more detail, and as you say, and I can't take a bigger picture rather than looking at this sort of piecemeal approach. Is it not the case, I'd like to defend the media a little bit, never thought I'd hear myself saying that, but it's not the case also the public want to see an end to early automatic release? You know, because they feel the sentence should be the sentence. Simple as that. Well, I think that's where a, a, a sentence review is required. A, a sentence planning review is required. We're basically in a sort of medieval or Victorian process, where the sentence that's handed down by way of a length of time to be spent in prison is based on what's been said before. Then it's automatically cut, um, and that's the bit that people don't understand because there's no condition, um, particularly for short-term prisoners. They don't have to behave themselves to be released. Um, after half their sentence has been served. They can be as rowdy as they like in the prison and they can be as uninterested in connecting with anything as they like and they're still released. And that's a bit that people don't understand because um, it's, it's unconditional at the moment. And I think if um, the people who hand down sentences were to say, I, I sentence you to 12 months, if it meant 12 months, then people would understand that more carefully. And if it, there could be conditions attached to that uh. about how someone engages. But at the moment, it's, it's a bit of a Frankenstein's monster. There are bits bolted onto sentencing which um, don't really add up to a complete being. Yes. Thank you, um, thank you for that. I would, I would agree with what's been said um, with victim support. Then it would be good to, to be able to see um, the introduction of sentence in council where um, enable courts to deliver similar um, outcomes for the same crime so there's no disparities across and then with victims we often experience that they don't understand there's confusion there's a lot of confusion about what it actually means what does the sentence actually mean um, when sentencing is handed down also we'll have to remember it's at, uh, still at a point of um, a lot of distress and trauma for victims and uh, taking in any information um, you know, can be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a transparency and clarity and also at the release of the offender as well. Um, victims' opinions and views need to be taken into account and that's all victims with, uh, you know, we, we have cited and made it known we'd like to see expansion of the current victim notification scheme to include all victims of all crimes so that the views are taken into consideration as to any kind of uh, supervision, community uh, reintegration that may take place. Um, so again, they have the chance if they wish to plan for their own personal uh, comfort and safety, or they're at least aware that there might be um, you know, a chance that they might bump into the offender on temporary release while they're actually doing their education in the local college. I thought they were told, I thought they were told that just now. Um, they are, um, on some certain occasions, there's a difference between being escorted and unescorted at the moment that's, uh, you know, been looked at with the current victim notification scheme. Do you want to come? Um, I'll take Roderick. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I missed somebody. Roderick, I'll take you now, please. Thank you, convener. Um, in the previous session, I talked about kind of incentives. Um, if I can refer to another part of the government's policy memorandum, um, they refer to the situation uh, where if automatic early release is ended, then prisoners, in their view, uh, would realise that there is an incentive to engage with uh, schemes to uh, modify their behaviour because if they don't, they will be there for the full term, whereas at the, the present time they can look and say, well, I'll be out anyway at two-thirds. Uh, well, could the panel like to comment on, on that matter? Yes, I think that's true. I, I completely agree with, with that analysis. I think by taking away automatic release, um, not only is there the sort of inevitable consequence of that, that you will be releasing uh, those who have been sentenced to, to serious custodial sentences back into the community cold without any compulsory supervision. But also, um, 
it could have the effect, as you say, of incentivising prisoners to engage more with whatever programmes, uh, adequate or inadequate, are in existence because they'll make more applications to the parole board. And I think, therefore, as I said before, the spotlight is going to come increasingly on the adequacy of these programmes. If more are demanding them, quite rightly, uh, because that's what society has said, it's, that's the deal. Um, and if the parole board has to make decisions more than in the past on the adequacy of those arrangements, then the spotlight is going to come on them. And I think you've heard evidence from a number of witnesses that that may not be a very favourable uh, spotlight, that it will be seen to be inadequate. And I think it also places a big dilemma for the parole board. Um, if the parole board has a case coming to it where it knows there's no automatic release, that this person could eventually, at the end of the sentence, be released cold into the community without any compulsory supervision, do we therefore take a calculated risk and put that person out on license because there will be some kind of compulsory supervision and less likelihood on balance of reoffending, Or that might go wrong and the person might offend and the parole board is going to be held accountable. Or do we play safe uh, and say, no, we'll not let you out, complete your sentence, um, but knowing at the same time that from a public point of view, that's basically transferring a potential risk to the public uh, whose right to life and security could be jeopardised by someone being released at the end of their sentence without any compulsory supervision. So I think a lot, of, a lot of spotlight is going to be cast on what up till now has been a largely invisible area. What is there within prisons that prepare prisoners for release and a reintegration into the community? And therefore, a question of resources um, has to be seen hand in hand. And I looked at the human rights sort of impact statement uh, with the bill, and it's simply not adequate. You know, it, all it will address is, are the measures on the face of it in the bill immediately going to be uh, in violation of the human rights of prisoners? Uh, and, and the answer given is no. But you have to look at the, the consequences which are foreseeable of ending automatic release and the jeopardy that then is cast to the public and the rights of the prisoners if they're not given the rehabilitation programmes uh, that they will be looking for uh, more than in, than in the past. So, so it's these unintended consequences that I think you know, the committee really has to, to look at, and I, I welcome the fact that you're doing so. That's a, a helpful answer. Could I just move on to whether anyone on the panel has any comments to make to, about kind of reoffending rates and um, prisoners currently kind of released on... Um, license uh, conditions and, and, and when the, those conditions cease to apply, whether there's no supervision. Uh, anyone able to throw any light on, the, on that? From our experience, people who are who have served long sentences and are released on license, <coughs> they're less likely to re-offend than, for example, short-term prisoners who've been released after um, half of their sentence have been served with no particular support. I think that license conditions and the conditions that lead to breach of those are being, um, as was mentioned earlier by Dr. Barry, um, those are, are rather restrictive and they lead to someone being recalled um, for a breach of license um, for something that wouldn't normally merit a jail sentence. And I think that's, that's a very harmful way of dealing with these things. But I think the reoffending rates um, must come down and it's not going to be helped by these strict and um, inconsistently applied um, breaches of conditions. But longer, the longer someone serves in prison, I mean, the people who come out of Schott's prison, for example, come out through the open estate, their reoffending rate is far less than those who are released through the gate of Schott's prison. They're the ones who haven't complied with programmes and haven't engaged. So there is some way forward for the work that's done in prisons to reduce reoffending for people who are in there for some considerable time. Okay, thank you. Margaret. It was to, to follow up on the recidivism point, um, which tends to occur more with low and medium risk offenders, uh, given this, uh, should, should there be more, a more wide-ranging system of, of reform? Who's going to pick up that? Yeah. Ms. Um, McKenzie. I mean, I think that's much more justifiable than looking... I think one of the things that came out of a lot of the different pieces of evidence that you received was that it wasn't entirely clear uh, quite why 
that you'd honed in on these two mm. particular categories of offender. I mean, particularly in the case of sex offenders, the international evidence seems to bear out a trend that says that recidivism levels are lower than average amongst sex offenders. But as we know, people on sort of low tariff offences who are in prison often for very short amounts of time are much more likely to reoffend. Um, conversely, with violent offenders, they are there is a higher uh, reoffending rate of violent offence. I mean, I'm just looking at the Law Society's evidence admittedly very small numbers, but I think they took that from parole board figures, which apparently are no longer available, but it was, it was on recalls. I think they had, in 2005 or 2006, I'm not sure, the 21 people released on licence for sex offences, 14 were recalled for non-compliance, three for crimes of dishonesty, one drug offence, and three sex offences. Um, on the violent offenders, there are 184 released uh, on licence, 65 were recalled for further violent offences, which is over a third. But... Um, Certainly, the message I was taking from a lot of the other submissions was that offence type or sentence length isn't necessarily the best, most reliable indicator of the likelihood of being a risk to the public on release. So maybe some further digging is, is worth doing by your committee in the next few weeks about trying to unpick that a bit. I know you've got a kind of panel of academics next week. You might be better in a better position to sort of dig into those sorts of statistics. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. So I agree with what uh, Ms. McKenzie has been saying, and uh, if you have a look at the Scottish Women's Aid submission as well, they, they actually um, agree and comment to say that the current kind of proposal excludes the vast majority of prisoners and do not include perpetrators of domestic abuse. Um, and they can be considered as high risk as reoffending. Um, um, so, but they might not often have the, the sentence of 10 years plus. So it's an exclusion group there. Mr. White. I agree that a wider ranging reform would be um, welcome and the idea of looking at everything from the possibility of diversion from prosecution in the first place through to using prison as a last resort rather than a convenient one would make quite a difference in many ways and uh, picking up the point of austerity and the like it's a lot more cost effective to keep somebody out of prison properly than it is to keep them in prison um, for any length of time at all. And I think that the, the, the scope for change is huge. My only concern is that if this bill is not processed somehow or other, that the excellent idea of changing the Friday release to maybe one or two days earlier might be lost. And that would be tragic for some people because of the risk of harm and reoffending uh, on Friday release. So I find myself in a cleft stick. Um, I, I, that point, our previous witness suggested that two days really wouldn't do very much in the grand scheme of things of providing the kind of through care that's necessary to, to be put in place to arrange housing, to arrange so many other things that really this would have to be done many weeks in advance of release. I think that there are two, two issues here. There's the work that would be done, that should be done but isn't always achieved in the prison in the last few weeks of a sentence to make practical arrangements. But some of the practical arrangements that are put in place for people who are released on a Friday are impractical in reality. If someone, for example, is released from Inverness Prison and they have to attend a housing appointment in Stornoway, they're not going to make it. Because the time, by the time they get there, given public transport and the like, um, the housing office will be shut. And that, and that immediately leads to a problem. Whereas... I realise it's only seen as being a very small change, mm -hmm. but for the lives of the people, and more people are released on a Friday than any other day of the week. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, people who are released on a Friday who don't make appointments are the ones who reoffend, who commit self-harm, who overdose, commit suicide, or reoffend to get back in because they've got nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't want that to be lost in what we're talking about today. That, that's a useful clarification. Yeah, it puts it in perspective. Yeah, thanks. Can I ask you, Margaret, yeah. is there any other way, just to explain to me why it has to be a Friday? Um, because can that not be changed in some other way than this? Well, um, I'm, I'm not here to tell um, politicians and Parliament how to change legislation or how to make things possible. Yes, you I, are. I, I would be very... Yes, you are. <coughs> you're, here, you're here to give us your experience and to tell well, us what we, what, what's flawed and what's not flawed well, and how we can make it better. I don't know what... what Didn't you know that was why you were here? <laughs> I, I, will, I will claim uh, uh, naivety on that one. Thank you very much. That's not you. Anyway, um, let's hear. Why is it a Friday? Why well, does it have to be a Friday? Because the, the length of time which services are open on a Friday 
is sometimes shorter than any other day. No, no. Why do people have to be released on a Friday, as I'm asking? Because oh, I don't oh, know. Oh, right. Because um, when, a, when a sentence is laid down, yes. the length of time from the date of, of that sentence being handed down is extended by the calendar and, I, and people end up who would be released on a Saturday or Sunday are also released on a Friday because people cannot be released on a Saturday or Sunday. So you end up with... So it's the weekend people that become the Friday people and that's uh, what makes the bulk. Well, the weekend people join the Friday people. Yes, I understand. And, and, and so the, the, if someone can be released a day or two before the technical date of the end of their sentence, then they have a better chance of engaging with services that will support them. I understand them. that bit. It was yeah. just why we had this bulge in it. Um, well, it's one of these things that uh, prisons and whatever don't operate at full strength over weekends. And that's why there were, at somewhere along the line in legislation that uh, predates my knowledge of these things, mm -hmm. um, people aren't released on a Saturday or Sunday. And if we were going to try and keep all the services open seven days a week, I think that would be a, a very difficult thing to apply effectively and would possibly be antisocial for the people involved in staffing offices. What's 1993 Act? I'm told it's a 1993 Act which determines that if you're to be released at the weekend, you'll get released on a Friday instead. Well, um, thank you for that clarification. So it could be amended, just amend that Act without having a whole bill. I'd be, I'd be delighted if we could do that. That would be great. Um, and thank you very much for pointing that out. <laughs> I, I, am, I am now less naive than I was two years ago. <laughs> no, I think it's to move the Friday as well. Yes, sorry. I just wanted to know that because Thank I didn't you. understand that bit. Next, I've got Christian. Having made a muddle out of something here, Christian, you take us Thank back to clarity. My turn to make a muddle out of things. Um, regarding the bill at its stands, would it be helpful uh, to, uh, to have the concern that everybody this morning has, has raised uh, because the biggest concern seems to be to have somebody released at the end of the sentences without any compulsory supervision. Would it be helpful if the bill was amended and if there were, say, two or three months compulsory supervision and releasing to the community or maybe in the open estate uh, for every uh, 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 prisoner, will that would help? Ms. Crombie. Thank you. Um, um, and under sacro submission, then they actually comment on this fact that uh, it would be good to see a reduction of automatic release to the last three months of the sentence. And uh, I know that Dr. Barry mentioned that the average time within the prison is the three months planning as well. So um, to, to victim support, it would you know, be kind of a, a, a something that we could look at or something to look at that, that three months is put in place. Um, to allow the, the kind of compulsory supervision to take place. Anybody else wish to comment? I agree with that. I have a feeling I've curtailed your submissions, <laughs> Mr. White, but never mind. That may um, not be a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else wish to comment on that? No? I, I have no. no if, if, oh, sorry, Christian. If, if I can uh, ask another one, I asked you to the previous uh, uh, person who, who came to give evidence. Uh, would, do you think the bill is targeting the wrong type of prisoners, of offenders? Uh, do you I know, Mr. White, that you talk about, uh, we do not consider it appropriate to dismantle the automatic release of prisoners in a piecemeal fashion. And I know Ms. Mackenzie talked about a piecemeal fashion. Is, when you talk about piecemeal fashion, do you talk about that the bill is targeting only a few offenders? And maybe the if ones. the bill will have more uh, it, it, it'll be more, it will, it will make more sense if the bill were targeting everybody. I agree that it would make more sense if it was not just those two groups. I think there's a, a whole review of the way in which prisoners are, well, people are sentenced in the first place and sent to prison, and I don't think we should pick on these two particular groups. I think the comments made previously about media focus on those groups um, it may be the reason why they're the ones picked first of all, but I think that um, a wider range of understanding could be extended to all people in prison to make sure that um, everyone understood from day one when their sentence was going to end and how it was going to end and how they were going to be managed back into the community in a constructive way. That, I think, would help a great deal. Anybody else wish to comment on that? Yes, I would just make the point that I made earlier that, and again, this was drawn from other submissions too, that 
There doesn't seem to be any evidence that offence type or sentence length is the most reliable indicator of the likelihood of being a risk to the public on release. Um, it's, it's, I can't come back at that with a better answer, but it might be that your panel next week is able to dig a bit deeper into that and shed a bit more light. One of the better answer, if if uh, if the bill wanted to pilot uh, the, the, the changes, would you have targeted of a type of offenders? Difficult question. Are you <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, excuse me, would that not, and I'll ask Professor Milnes, would that, you couldn't pilot it so one group of prisoners was subject to one regime in one part of the country and in another with whether or not they had early automatic early release? Could you do that, or would that breach the rights of those who were, who were still getting entitlement to automatic yeah, early release? Yeah, I, I don't think that would um, be able to, to fly at that. all. I mean, it's difficult to understand what the logic that underpins this bill is, because when a judge sentences someone, um, they will pass an extended sentence if they think that the person needs to be subject to compulsory supervision when they come back into the community. And we know that the biggest recidivists are the shorter term offenders. But the government has decided to take a category of offenders who don't get extended sentences by judges because the judges don't think they are the most serious and who we know are the, not the most likely to re-offend. But the government says, well, it's because of the, the length of the sentence and for public protection they should stay in prison for public protection. But it's that category that the government has isolated for special attention, you could say, who are then going to be released cold into the community and more likely to re-offend than if they weren't released cold and subject to automatic release. So it's actually turning things on its head and from a public protection point of view, increasing the risk to the public of reoffending by those individuals. And, and therefore it's very difficult to understand why, why do you not want to do a whole piece look at the criminal justice system. But if there is a particular problem with a category of prisoners, it's difficult to see what this is going to achieve uh, it's it counterintuitive um, because it's going to have consequences that will increase the risk um, to public protection. I don't, I'm looking at the purpose of the bill and it, it says um, to allow prisoners serving all but very short sentences released from prison are particularly suitable for their reintegration into the community. I don't think it would be possible to amend this bill to bring in uh, lower sentences, I think that wouldn't fit within the purposes. Would that be a fair comment? So can I ask then, is there possibilities under the Criminal Justice Bill which we have to move into that territory, as I understand it? Maybe the committee wants to look at that later. Um, Margaret. If I could just return to um, VSS's um, written submission where you refer to the Scottish Prison Commission report of 2008 called for automatic air release to be ended for those convicted of custodial sentences of two years or more. Um, and it seems particularly recommendation 21 provisions around risk assessment, conditional release and compulsory post-release supervision arrangements should be reserved for those serving two years or more. Could you comment on that aspect of, of your written submission? Yes, and thank you. Um, victim Support Scotland then. First of all, it's going back to ensuring that whichever system is taken up, then there's the clarity and transparency mm. there and that victims have the knowledge and information that's required. And we believe that all victims, um, whether, you know, whatever crime has been committed, then should receive that information and should make sure that they have the ability to be able to be safe in their own homes so they're aware of when, when offenders are being released, they're aware of any conditions that are attached to that release and it shouldn't really matter if that is um, you know, a 10-year sentence or, or a two-year sentence. So we believe that for both short-term and for long-term prisoners, then victims should receive that information of what is happening. Let you finish, Margaret. Yeah. Um, also, would it be fair to say recommendation 21, the risk assessments, conditional release, compulsory post-release supervision should be um, also applying to those for serving a sentence of two years or more? Yeah. 
Yeah. I have it's a fatal thing to say. I have nobody else indicating they want to ask a question, so I've put my blinkers on here. Uh, can I thank you very much uh, for your evidence? I'm just checking. We've got the criminal justice social work next week. Professor Tassa should be, may be able to come. I've got the um, Risk Management Authority, Pro Board, and Staff Association. So it'll be interesting to Professor McNeil. I'm Professor McNeil, so it's interesting to put these uh, issues you've raised appropriately with us. Thank you very much for your evidence. And uh, as we agreed, we now move into private session. Thank you.